two, episode three of New Histories, uh, hosted by Gregory Eddie Jones. And I will read Gregory's bio. So he is a post-photographic artist, writer, and publisher based between Philadelphia and New York. He has exhibited his work internationally and throughout the United States, and his self-published books are held in numerous institutional photo book collections, including libraries at the Museum of Modern Art, the Met, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, Victoria and Albert Museum, Yale University, among many others. Jones was named a Foam Talent in 2018 and a Paul Huff Award nominee in 2021. In addition to his photographic practice, Jones has contributed to After Image, Paper Journal, Lens Culture, Unseen Magazine, among others. From 2012 to 2021, he was the founding editor and publisher of In the In-Between, an independent platform for 21st century photographic authorship. So I'll hand it over to you, Gregory, and you can introduce Liliana. Great. Well, well, well. Thank you once more, Mike. Um, this is the the sixth episode of of New Histories, and um, really, really uh, excited to have Liliana um, join us. So thank you, Liliana, for uh, for for coming aboard. Um, uh, Liliana Farber is a Uruguayan-born, New York-based visual artist. Through research-based processes and digital strategies, Farber investigates notions of land um, imaginaries, unmappable spaces, utopias, and techno-colonialism. Her work uh, has been exhibited at the National Museum of Contemporary Art Lisbon, the Center for Book Art New York, Ars Electronica in Linz, um, Arbeit Gallery in London, uh, Panke Gallery in Berlin, Oblique Nuage uh, Gallery, I hope I'm pronouncing these right, uh, in Paris, and MNVA Museum in Uruguay. Uh, Farber's work was supported by the Lumen Prize for Art and Technology, Artist Grant, um, Asylum Arts, Offsite Projects, Wasaic Projects, and the NARS Foundation. Um, and Farber holds an MFA from Parsons School of Design. Uh, welcome, Liliana. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure for uh, to be part of, of this series and, and to share my work with you guys. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, um, so um, I like to, let me see if it's working, yeah. I'd like to start um, talking about my work uh, with a bit of an, uh, an explanation of my background. I was born in Uruguay, in Montevideo, uh, to a family that comes from uh, all different places uh, from Poland. I, I lived for a few years in Tel Aviv, and now I'm based uh, in New York. And I come, I travel my life um, I can map my journey. I moved around the world and I come from a family that also moved around the world. Um, and, and that made me really curious about, about mapping these journeys and about mapping in general. So, um, you know, um, maps are tools that allow us um, to, to map a, to map journey to understand where we are, but also they they define the the world. They define what it's up, what it's down, um, and and sort of this this narrative of how we understand uh, the world. In in growing up in in Uruguay, I was um, always exposed to these um, colonial maps, these views uh, from from the. I call it if these views from above, from the from the from the imperials that govern um, those lands, from uh, the Spaniards or uh, the Portuguese, um, and they would try to um, to understand this this uh, this land that they that they just found uh, existed. And what I am really fascinated by by these images is all these narratives and mythologies and fantasies um, and all these, you know, um, stories that they were embedded in, um, in, in these ideas of the world and, um, and how they evolve, not only in terms of uh, technology and, in and that meant in, in shape and accuracy, but also how, how they 
uh, the ideas of of exotic or danger or what what kind of thoughts do they have about these territories, how they evolve. Um, and you know, uh, I've been I've been always fascinated with maps and. In 2005, Google Earth was launched, and like naturally, I was um, enchanted with this new platform. And I spent countless of hours um, doing like traveling virtually to every place in the world. Uh, Uruguay, uh, it's it's kind of place in in a, in a southern corner um, of of the world, and uh, and it allowed me this new technology allowed me to travel anywhere and to visit. For example, these um, towns in Poland, where my family is from, uh, places that I haven't been uh, like never in my life, but this technology allowed me to to do this uh, to do these uh, explorations. Um, but one thing that I'm really fascinated is as I show the the previous maps, the colonial maps. We, we see them now and we know that these are drawings, that they have these mistakes, that these have these narratives, these illusions, these mythologies. But when we see satellite photography, we have the fantasy of, of more like a neutral and an objective form of representation. It's uh, the combination of a mach automatic um, created uh, images made by machines with a kind of divine perspective that creates the illusion. Um, but there's not just thing as, as neutral data, as neutral photography. And uh, this is the thing, the kind of things that I'm, that I'm really interested about uh, in thinking how um, information uh, companies, uh, how do they take, arrange, store, clean and distribute data and how this uh, really affects the way that they define the world, that they define the way that we perceive the world. So um, I'm really interested in, in different ways that this happened and one is resolution. So um, in satellite photography, it takes um, in, in the platform, it takes different um, is technologies um, to to capture uh, the world and and to capture the to photograph of higher resolution utilize different kind of technologies and the more resolution um, it's uh, it's more of um, a, an investment of 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 capital and so the platform decides to do this uh, only in places that are deemed important so for example. All these uh, three photographs are at the same altitude, are taken at the same altitude of 30 meters. Um, and in one in one side we have Union Square. We have like an uh, amazing resolution. You can see like um, um, a, a person um, a walking. Then you have uh, Plaza Independencia, that it's uh, the most important square in Montevideo, Uruguay. When you see all, all you already see that the resolution uh, is lower. And then uh, Kikara Medina, it's um, it's a square in Tel Aviv uh, where you can see that there is no resolution because there is an agreement uh, between um, Israeli government and Google platform. So these are different ways in which resolution um, deems places that are important, places that are not important, and maybe places that are too important. Um, and the other thing that I'm really interested about is the time of the year and the frequency places are being photographed. Uh, usually the world is um, photographed in spring, uh, but there are places um, in, like uh, when I was doing some research in some towns in Poland, I realized that uh, some places are photographed in the winter. And this, this changes uh, the way we perceive um, a place. It's different to see a place that it's uh, that is green, that is full of life, and it's and a place that it's kind of grayish, that is kind of dead. Um, and also the frequency. Um, um, I was I was looking at the recent uh, uh, photos of New York. Um, um, Union Square is not is uh, this is the newest one, but other places in New York is twenty twenty three. Um, but some places um, in the world um, are, are never updated. And this also changes um, 
the the usability and the perception and and really how um how the world um, is perceived um lately i've been um i've been looking at them um uh, with everything that is going on in the middle east i was i was uh, looking to photograph of uh gaza city in palestine to see if um if it was um updated this image and um uh, obviously, it it wasn't the latest one was 2022, and it, yeah, I was I kept me wondering um, when this image is going to be updated and if they will allow us to see um, uh, the the scope of of distraction, um, and and it, it made me also think that uh, if if it's not for these um, instances. Of of really knowing what's going on in the world, why do we have this this technology? Um, and um, my work deals um, I, a lot with the idea of of uh, techno colonialism. This is um, uh, um, a, a concept of looking at how um, new uh, corporations that deal with data and technology are taking the place of older imperials in the world and really um, changing uh, power structures through information and capital flow. Uh, and for example, um, you know, technology corporations, they, they take uh, mine some rare uh, elements in some place of the world, and then they use um, cheap labor in another to train machine learning, and they give us all, all these algorithms to take us, you know, all um, our money and they funnel to some place uh, somewhere in the world. So this is, um, a, something that I explore in my work, and and for that reason, I I always connect some sort of um, a, old archives or a, representations with with contemporary ones to create a sort of uh, tension that works um, that that expose the ways that um, the, these corporations are are enabling um, these sort of um, older um, paradigms. So um, I spent a lot of time um, in in Google Earth, and I'm been fascinated by by the mistakes, uh, by the textures, um, but uh, by all these things that show us how. Um, a, how this representation is fictional. Um, so in this in this side we have on the on the left side uh, the South Pole, on the right side the North Pole, and one of the things that I, I was I found out through one of my researches um, was uh, the longitude line. It that is an imaginary line that is product of um, of colonial endeavors of this necessity of of. Um, a, of traveling and returning uh, to some point, and it's a it's a it's a line that doesn't exist, uh, and it was it was set up to to be uh, to cross London by in, in, in to set to set London as a point zero as a zero time. This line it doesn't exist, but it exists in Google Earth. So um, in these places, um, at the end of the world, when you when you cross the North Pole, it's very visible, and and I found that really interesting how um, uh, these these uh, mathematical paradigms that I, again they are, they don't fall really part of the world uh, they exist on the platform, um, and in general I I'm really interested in. Um, in how um, uh, the emptiness uh, is portrayed, or the not important, or this, uh, or the seemingly lack of data, how it's portrayed uh, in in the platform. And for me, uh, um, so I gravitate uh, towards the oceans a lot in my work. Um, oceans um, cover seventy percent of of the Earth's surface, but only five percent of um, of the oceans are um, photographically um, uh, mapped. And and 
um, I find that really interesting because it's also some something that uh, people don't really consider and they think that the entirety of the world uh, is photographed. And um, there are several um, technological challenges to photograph the oceans. Um, First of all, the images will appear as completely black or white, dependingly of if the the position of the camera and if the if the light gets sucked by the by the waters or if reflected if it's reflected. But you would you wouldn't see the the blues that that we see with uh, with our eyes. Um, and another other challenge is how you know Google takes the satellite cycle all these photos and then you need to have some points in common some some element to kind of stitch the images together um the the oceans they they don't have that so they will make like a really specific uh, task um to try to stitch water together and the other thing is water moves um and it's it's the nature of of water, and it's 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 against the nature of of photography for 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 this case. Um, and another thing that um, uh, it has been a focus of my work um, for the for the past few years also were islands. Um, I'm really interested in the in the, in the idea of the. Um, of the empty uh, island as, as this as this trope of um, of coloniality of this idea of of also of capitalism of, of finding something that you can take because it doesn't belong to anybody and um, and through that um, fantasy a lot of the world has been reshaped uh, even um, if it's not. Uh, if, if they were not empty at all. But also I, I think that this idea of, of, of finding new islands, it also applies um, to the idea of, of technology. And you know, this also this new hype that we have with um machine learning of, of that we can still find these places that we can extract endless um uh, capital. Um so um uh, with this in mind, um, I have this work um, that focuses on phantom islands. These are islands that appeared for many years in maps, but never existed in reality. Some of those islands are like Atlantis, are more famous, uh, they come from uh, mythologies. Some other islands um, come from different reasons. Sometimes uh, they are... Um, part of uh, a, a technical mistakes. They, they, they thought they were someplace else. They, they were mistaken where they were and they see a land that is, was already mapped and they remapped it and in different locations. Sometimes there was like a low cloud or an iceberg and they think um, so, and there are some um, uh, mirages and they think there is a, a new land. Sometimes there are completely um, lies uh, but what all these islands have uh, in common is that they are um, product of of a colonial mindset of of expansion of this fantasy of 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 having having more land. Um, so I started this project with a research of um, of these islands in which maps they appear, when they disappear, who found them. Um, and what were the stories behind those um, those uh, lands? And then I trained a machine learning algorithm um, with real islands uh, taken from Google Earth and line drawings uh, that I made of, of those islands. So the algorithm would understand the relationship between a line drawing and this um, visual language of, of Google Earth. Um, and once um, the, this algorithm was trained, I fed it the maps of the places that, that never existed and received um, Google Earth looking images. Um, so for example, we have Atlantis uh, and this is, uh, this is the image uh, for my work of, of the Atlantis Island. And I always place um, the name, the location, 
and from when uh, to when they were part of maps. And this is sort of the idea of the work is kind of like a trick the viewer. Um, uh, I want them to believe at the beginning that this is just like a, a print of a, a Google Earth screenshot, and then there's something off. And for me, this text is a is a thing that reveals that um, that we should uh, be not so much faithful to the to the images that that we see. Um, and uh, this is Saprobana. Uh, this island was thought to be uh, in the south of India. Jupiter Reef is one of my favorites because it was um, a group of islands that survived until 2015 uh, in maps. And uh, it was on the South Pacific Ocean. And I, it's, it's interesting to see when I was doing research on this project, um, how um, to survive on maps, islands needs to be really, really small. Um, Rupes, uh, it was believed to be um, like a little hut at the North Pole. Um, but for me, I, I, I love that idea about um, about the fantasy of um, it also they also were ideas of uh, Antarctica before uh, before um, no man or woman went there or, or saw. Uh, but these ideas of there has to be some land there um, and um, uh, Morel um, and uh, this is a series of uh, 12 uh, images. Um, uh, the work is called uh, Terra Mima Spectum. Um, it's 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 a bit of a joke that I, that I made with myself. Um, and it's Terra Mima Spectum means uh, land in in sight in um, in Latin. I just Google translate and how um, and I just like I'm imagining. I, I, actually, I made a translation from Spanish that uh, the Spaniards would say tierra a la vista when they would see some land. And I just made like a translation on translation to something that will sound like something. Um, but then um, uh, reading, uh, looking at some records, I, I figured out that actually in English, they would say land ho, land ho. But, um, <laughs> you know. Um, so talking about those uh, those records, um, when I finished um, uh, the project Terra Maspecto, I became really curious about how these um, islands uh, entered the geography, how they became part of of our world. Um, and I went, uh, I did a research, and I went to the logbooks of the captains of their expeditions that either discover those islands or the ones that found out that these islands, um, they, don't, um, uh, they don't actually exist. Um, and I took some fragments um, from all, uh, from the descriptions and I created a new narrative, a new story um, that talks about uh, technology, um, the desire of of knowledge, of power, and how uh, the crown um, it, it, it incentivizes and and it's it, it, it's that's really want to um, to discover the world. It's it's about um, a geography and um, and really also the idea of becoming famous. Um, and I took um, all these um, all these fragments, um, just of the of the text that talk about uh, the islands in questions. And the only thing I removed was uh, the name of the island, but it appears so it becomes like um, uh, like intertwined story that uh, kind of makes sense. Um, and I, I I do think that my, my work. Um, it, it's it's a bit it's a bit of um a fuse of a collage in different forms and um 
in in my use of um a, of photography i am um, I, I i do collab collages in, with the with the help of uh of algorithms um but in this case it's just like um a, a pure um uh, old fashioned collage of of text uh in the last uh in the last page of the of this piece um they show all the all the uh, the resources that were consulted and um and kind of in a way reveal that um that this was um a fabricated story um and something that that also I, for me, it's really interesting. Um, it's to always be at the edge of um, reality and fiction. And I feel like these islands, in a way, um, they were on on those edges. And I like also um, when when I created this story, it is a, it's a story that it's uh, that is that I'm just use. I'm not carrying anything. I'm just taking this this actual um text um but uh but they in in their way the text themselves are are it's not as truthful so this is the idea of uh amalgamation of um of reality and fiction um and the next um uh, work that I, that I want to share with you uh, it's called a uh, solari um again uh taking um a project a project name a title uh from latin and but in this case um i i borrowed the uh, the title from this from this book um in 1528 um an italian benedetto bondone published um uh, this book um, isolario uh and it is an atlas of all existing islands in the world, and I, when I when I heard about it, I just thought it was um, really fascinating. This um, the idea of at that time that there was so much unknown to really to say that you know um, everything, every island that there is in the world, and especially because I feel like um, an island is such a, um, it's it's a concept that we still struggle to define in, in our age, you know, if, if like if you throw a rock in, a, in the water, is it an island? Um, there is there is like international law um, that, for example, an island it has to be um, a piece of land that it's above water in high tide, but it, it can it, it needs to sustain human uh, life. This is the definition, the international definition. And I uh, have there is um a rock in the middle of the North Atlantic. Uh, it's called Rockall, which is a very very tiny uh rock that just it's like makes its nose um outside of water, and uh in order to and it's uh it's uh disputed by different countries, but in order to um to claim it. Uh, Britain sent um, a soldier to live for 40 days um, alone. Um, you can find uh, photos on the internet. It's very funny, just this guy sitting alone. Um, so this idea of um, of what is an island, it's, it's really interesting for me. And like, you know, this, um, this idea of defining the world, this idea of wanting to control everything, um, through one lens, one perspective, one narrative. Um, it's it's something that um that, that truly fascinates me. And so I I went to um I, to antique uh, world maps uh, that kind of also um display this idea of the whole um and recreated um those maps with custom software that kind of digitally weaves images taken from Google Earth. Um, again, kind of like pairing um, these old ways of, um, of defining the world uh, with, with, new uh, with the new ways um, that we do it, um, maps 
they were not only these these global maps at the time. They were not only a way to to showcase uh, the world, but it was also a, a way to kind of appropriate the world and also create what's the center, uh, what's what's important, and also like kind of like um, eh, to take it for oneself. And I think like this is this is the role of um, contemporary. Um, technologies that kind of distribute uh, information and and I feel like um that um this is the, the also the role of uh of of Google so um I recreated uh this this these maps uh using uh how was I saying a, a custom a custom software and what you see is kind of the ghost of these older maps um, with kind of the look and feel of these this known colors um, that kind of um, um, we um, recognize as part of, of the platform. Um, So yeah, so I um, the series uh, takes um, uh, a bunch of of, um, of different maps uh, from a, from different uh, cultures and times, and um, yeah, for me, yeah, what it's interesting when the words are printed, and it's kind of also. Um, to see all these um all these details um uh, all these mythologies that come forward and, and to and, and also to really show how um how I can manipulate I or what whoever can manipulate uh this um uh, these digital images and and make other worlds with it. Um and the last work um that um that I want to share um today um it's called to hold um this is a um a, a very small work of a um four four by four inches something like that um it, it is um a, a video and and custom hardware that presents all the colors that um Google Earth um uses to represent um the oceans. Um so um as I was saying before this the oceans in Google Earth are are just uh mathematical renderings. Uh they don't have any photographic um information. And um I was um I was really fascinated by that and so I created a script to isolate uh, every single shade of blue that that is used to to represent the ocean it's around 17000 colors and then these uh these shades are arranged in a timeline um one per frame um so they create around 30 minutes a video that presents um uh, all the colors and i kind of I, I kind of see this work as as if the world that uh, Google presents, if it were true, and if I if if the world was made out of pixels, and I would I could take one pixel from out of the ocean and put it on a wall in a gallery space, um, and and this pixel presents all all his neighboring pixels. Um, so the um, colors are arranged um, a, according to uh, the the name that they have um, a, in in the online universe. So that's why they're not they're not a, arranged for the human eye. They're arranged um, for for the computer code. So that's how um, it kind of uh, variates. Um, a, and um, 
Yeah, I know. I just um just want to say that uh this um this, this the name of the works the idea no of of to is again to contain to contain the everything no? and and I love that this is uh this is a very very small work um that that holds the the entirety of 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 the of the planet. In, in within a bit like um some servers uh on right now they do they have um uh, sometimes our all our memories and um yeah, I don't know our genetic code um and uh and to finalize um I, I just gonna say that I was inspired um there is this um uh, very short story on exactitude of science uh, from Borges, and uh, in which uh, a, there is uh, there is a town that has um, very accurate map. Uh, it's so accurate that it's this exact same size of the town uh, it represents, and therefore it becomes really unusable. Uh, and so the town lives this exact copy of the town but in but in uh, in a drawing um in the desert just just to be because they decide that it's it's better to use uh just the town because it it's uh, it was more practical than to use the copy of the town and uh i sometimes feel that that google earth which is like infinite uh zooming capabilities it's kind of like um reenacts this um this uh, uh this map that Borges talks about and it's the same the same size of the thing it it represents um and um yeah I, I was just I was just fascinated by by that and um and yeah in uh in a way um talking about talking about, about everything i just wanted to do like a like a very a very uh small work and i think that's it that i have um to share with you today uh, uh such amazing work all around thank you liliana um what a what 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 a treat to to have gone on that little journey um Mike, did do do you have any uh, questions or anything at the top of your mind uh, about uh, from what Liliana shared? Yeah, so I was the part that I really enjoyed was when you were talking about um, the unknown and colonialism, and how about how this how the idea that colonial colonialism is kind of an exploration of the unknown, but also this idea that they would create these islands out of complete fiction just to you know out of some kind of like narcissism just to say they oh we discovered this and this is out there and how many years did it take for them to finally realize it was all a lie or it was all just kind of you know a fantasy so I, that's interesting and i never really considered that and i i knew that there were these phantom islands out there i remember you know like you said like atlantis and things like that and they were on maps and sometimes they were there just for like decorative you know like yeah. for the map it wasn't just it, you know people just like well maybe it's there maybe it's not but i just think that's really interesting i never really took the time to think about it and that's one of the things i love about art is it slows you down and gets you to start thinking about well, why why is it the way that's the way it is so i appreciate you sharing that because now when i look at maps and when i think of colonialism also just the idea that there was a lot of kind of narcissism involved with that as well yeah yeah i mean I just uh I I think sometimes uh to make this this travel this exploration was was really expensive and it took a lot of time and they have to convince um the crown or some somebody with like a lot of money to invest um and sometimes I don't know there were two years in seas and you have to have the ship and and to pay um to the you know um to the people that works and the food and everything and, and you don't find anything. So sometimes the easiest way was just to say you found something 
And um, in the description of some islands, I love to see sometimes they say, um, because sometimes, you know, there is drawings, there are maps of these islands and they describe whatever they have, what type of formations, oh, this is, but there's no water or there's no reason to come here. And, you know, um, and, and, um, and I don't know, I just, th I feel some, in our, in our time, um, there was recently this story about Theranos, um, this, uh, there's also um, Hulu, I think it's Hulu, um, a series about um, this company that wanted to make um, a technology to, to, to take um, blood tests from one drop of blood. And they invested all this money, they couldn't find a way and they lied. And I feel like, Again, uh, these uh, paradigms of how how we deal with 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 the with the unknown, with the this discovery of the world, like um, investment, and you know, and it's it's still the same, um, and and sometimes the result is it's it's lies. I I, I was really interested in. Um you know, the, the, in the beginning of your talk, when you're talking about your initial interest in mapping, and it had me thinking about how, um, like creating mapping is almost a kind of biography in a way. And, and, you know, you, you don't often think about it, but I, I feel like when we had the experience of looking at maps, there's something, um, you know, in similar kind of way, how you might be introspective and you're trying to con consider like who you are in relation to others. It's like uh, looking at a map and, and viewing where you are in relation to everything else um, is, uh, I, I think, such an interesting starting point for, you know, the, the things you were mentioning about maps as narratives and, and mythologies and, you know, the, the, the source of, you um, you know, where kind of like this nexus of human knowledge, but also imagination and, and curiosity. Um, I, I, I wonder if you could talk a, a little bit more about your initial interest and in, in fascination in maps. Um, and, and like, had like how early on did did that happen and, and like when at what point in your artistic career did you kind of turn to maps as as your principal subject matter yeah um i i do think that um uh my interest was was very early although um i wasn't doing uh art about it but i remember in uh in media school um or it was in in just uh, school that uh, I they asked us to draw uh, a map of the world and the it, the teacher thought it was obvious that we we're gonna use like you know um, to draw it when you put um, this transparent paper on top of the map and I just copy from and uh, I got scolded because you know. Mm -hmm. You never draw a map. Uh, maps are not drawings. <laughs> it's, it's science, and and this I I think like this comment of of the teacher it's it's it stuck with me. This idea of um, the you sh you never should do art with maps because um, oh, even though I was very good at drawing <laughs> and I thought I did a great job because uh, this is science. Um, we don't uh, and. So um, it took me it took me a while. Uh, I think um, I was at some point I was doing photographs of of, of architecture. I was doing some works um, around um, the solar system, the galaxies, and um, um, it took me it took me a while to really to really come to uh, what I'm doing right now, and and, and also. Um, like even now, like my current, uh, my current project, I became even more personal, and I'm uh, I'm doing some research on on Poland and Polish towns, but um, but it is something that um, that I'm really really fascinated, and um, I feel like there's also the, the there's something very local 
about um, um, about fascination with maps uh, in the sense of um, the the full name of Uruguay is um, is the country um, um, to the east of the Uruguayan River, the La Republica Oriental del Rio Uruguay. And so it's um, and there is something about even on our name that we are mapped in in a place and i think like um um we have a, a very rich uh, history of of looking at maps um 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 uh, torres garcia that it's like um uh, it's one of uruguay most famous artists did this inverted map of south america i think it's one of the iconic um images of him and says um your north it's our south um and and i grew up with this um with this history of uh, of not accepting kind of like um our place in maps and the maps that were were given uh to us and um and sometimes i feel um um it takes uh it takes a while to really come back to the heritage of of oneself, even since it's also the 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 um the history of of um, Uruguayan artists and and um and and their interests. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting to think just how and I I think you you talk reminded me about this a lot about just how politicized maps can be and in, in terms of you know we don't often think about you know whenever we're looking at a map we don't think about who made it or what agenda they may have had um or you know we we don't think about how they compiled their information or if if it's a copy or if it's uh it, there's so many unknown questions we don't even think to ask i feel i feel like maps are such a common presence in our lives we take for we take them for granted quite a bit and, and don't think about the underlying mechanisms of how they came to be in the first place um and so you your work had me thinking a, a lot about that as you were talking about it it was um re really really interesting thank you yeah i mean uh something that i found really interesting is how um uh, geographical uh, data is always recycled. It's never um, uh, Google didn't didn't go um, you know with a with a meter to to the streets to to uh, it is a company that buys another company that buys this data set that you know that this got come from this you know and you can you can trace you can go really really in the history of that and. And it's a, always a work in progress, and there are always these funny histories of um, a, of places that appear in Google Earth maps, but they, they don't really exist, or you know. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, um, for me, it's um, it's it's uh, it's really fascinating, also, uh, to think about as as we uh, rely even more in these technologies in our in our day to day and kind of um navigate our, our own cities uh through this um, through these technologies um it's um it's it, it, it's it's really interesting for me also you no know, places of of hierarchies i was i was in uruguay um uh, a few months ago and i was using google maps when i was driving and I didn't know, and they changed the orientation of some streets in my city, like in the last year, yeah. but they were not updated in in the app. Uh, so it led me to some uh, interesting moments, in, you know, uh, in the car. So um, these things, like you know, which which places are really updated or are being thought about, and which places are not, and. And who designs um, these platforms, and who ends up using them? And if the people that use them, they were in the minds of the people that um, that the, that they designed. So these are all um, questions that, for me, are 
are really fascinating. Yeah. 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 I, I, it's always funny to think I stumbled on this thing on my phone a while ago where I found that, um, like Google tracks my location. So like I could go backwards in time and see where I was on the Google map at any given date, which was kind of unsettling, um, very unsettling, I would say, but also interesting in terms of like, you know, it, it's not enough to map the geography. You now have to map, you know, who is occupying the geography and when and where and um, you know, I'm, I'm leaving like a, a data trail of all the locations that I occupy um, without me even knowing it really. And I, I don't know if I figured out how to turn that setting off or not. So it's probably still logging my location and just being fed into this big machine of data. And, um, a, 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 and that's another thing that, that really interests me about, you know, what you're exploring is just like these underlying pieces of information that go into feeding, um, you know, contemporary experience and, and how data is um, almost kind of a new sort of natural resource to be exploited and, and to be bought and sold and, and refined and packaged and, and used in so many different ways that, uh, um, that you know, we, we, we don't really think about because we can't see it. Um, so it's, it's really interesting just in, in the sense of how, um, you know, part of your work is exploring like these unseen powers that, 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 that fuel, you know, uh, contemporary life, right. That we can't see. And, and, and it, it's so hard to quantify because of that, because it like it, exists in our imagination essentially we know it's there we know it's um you know data is always circulating in such incredible volumes and now but it's it, it it's hard to really rationalize it when it's um when it's so invisible yeah and um it's it's interesting to to think also how the experience that you mentioned and how we interact with the digital map and how we, uh, this digital map is really affecting our, our cities, right? Because um, uh, the companies know, like for example, which uh, streets are or more, um, uh, there is more data that flows in those streets. It's not just like a, a human perception of where are where people are, but you can know like where people are at which at which time, and and then um, uh, city developers can you know take actions accordingly and 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 to put like you know advertisement or or create you know or I don't know a building or something here and there. And um, and and for me, it's really fascinating how um, this the digital representation of the world is uh, affecting uh, the world itself. Mm -hmm. um, and this, you know, and this trade off um, that it's not only it is it doesn't became doesn't become just a representation, but a but a place that we inhabit and uh, that we. Um, that we spend some some part of our time there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, we we've got a few minutes left. Um, Mike, do do you have any uh, other other thoughts or anything that you wanted to jump in and and share? Yeah, I have one more thought. But if anybody that's watching wants to ask a question, just hit the raise your hand button, and I'll get you on to ask your question. But so I want to get back to like the idea of your work as kind of, you know, fine art and specifically the idea of it as conceptual art. I'm a huge fan of conceptual art. I like that there are tons of ideas around a physical object, like an individual object. And that's what I see a lot in your work. And when we uh, talk to uh, Danielle Izzo also, like I like seeing the art object and I appreciate it. It's like a refinement, it, like re conceptual art for me just keeps getting refined and refined more and more. And so now we have these really interesting, you know, beautiful 
objects that are created that all come from con concept or ideas. And I just want to know if you can like talk about that at all. Like the final piece isn't really the final piece. You have to understand the concepts and everything and the ideas behind it. And you can appreciate each one separately, but when they come together, you just, it gets much, much deeper. Yeah, I think like um, I have a different kind of works that function in different way. Um, my image based artworks, specifically the, this, for example, the series uh, is Solari. Um, they also um, have more like a, a pictorial um, aspect that kind of like um, um, uh, appeals to a more traditional way of understanding art. Um, but the other pieces uh, like to hold um, are, yeah, are are purely conceptual and 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 they stem from this very good, as I say, it's very rich um history of um of um of of works um and um uh, there's something that that it, it's uh what the work present in relationship to what the viewer knows and then in in this um in this encounter i think the work happens um, same like um, with Terry my spec to him. Um, it is, I, I like I play with the idea that um, that the viewer knows know what Google Earth is like. What like that can recognize those images as such. It is such part of like um, our popular culture that you see. It's, it's uh, okay, um, because something that is also interesting for me is how. Um, the satellite photography from Google Earth, it doesn't really look like satellite photography. The greens are very, um, they have one shade, you have one shade of blue. You see when you have like, uh, if I if I go back um, to, um, to, you have you have the borders of, of, of the ocean and then this other shade of ocean. And it really doesn't look like the world, but um, we are such trained to see, to see Google Earth like a, a representation of the real world that, um, that, that we would buy this uh, representation. And I think like um, the work happens in, in between in this, um, in this also realization of, of what you know what the viewer knows. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, look just looking at this piece specifically, you can see that there's balance with the colors, with the space and everything else. So the selection of this area or the generation of this selection that you then, you know, edited to be the piece that you decided to use. You know, it's it's interesting that these objects become like i said i think they're a little more refined and and they support the you know they they support the concept so it's you enjoy looking at them but then when you get when you investigate like okay why was this made and why is why is this important it's it's i just love the way with your work and with danielle's work just how you can get so much deeper and get so much more enjoyment out of it when you understand it as conceptual art versus, you know, oh, this is a photograph or this is a, you know what I mean? So it's, yeah. I really appreciate that. Yeah, um, I once, um, I started my uh, my career as a, a, a train as a, as a painter. Um, I, I left that very, very early. And then it's when I went to to photography, uh, mixed with painting, and 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 I left that all as well. But um, I think that uh, this um, uh, this this training of 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 composition of color of um of um of of seeing uh it it uh is it stayed in 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 my work. Well, nobody has raised their hand, so I think, Gregory, if you want to either wrap up or if uh, Liliana has some final thoughts, I'll leave yeah. it to you two to decide. Well, uh, I, I think this has been uh, 
been really amazing. Thank you so much, Liliana, for sharing your work. Um, my, uh, I'm, I, I'm really eager to, um, to, to see what you make next. So please, please stay in touch and keep me posted on, on new projects and, and everything. Um, uh, I, well, I, I guess this will be a wrap for, for season two of, of new histories and, uh, it really, really nice to go out on such a high note that, um, um, uh, Mike, I, I suppose you and I will, will, will chat soon about, uh, you know, what, what season three, uh, could look like if we, if we decide to go ahead with it, but, um, irregardless, thank you so much, Liliana, for, for joining us and, and, and doing this. And it, 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 it was a real, real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for inviting me and for hosting me. This is great.